Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Foggy Day on Olympus, grown-up discussions for grown-up people. If it's fuel for your existing opinions, or stuff about what they don't want you to know, or shocking revelations that prove the people you don't like anyway are even worse than we told you last week, well, most of the rest of the internet is for that. Here, we explore history, religion, and culture, and why they matter as dispassionately as we can. And today's topic is how Israel has changed 1948 to the present, which is number five in our series on Israel and the Jews. So I began by asking, obviously all countries have changed pretty radically over, what is it, 75 years, right? So we're looking at this because the people who live in Israel now are in a different frame of mind than the people who founded the state. Yes, that, that is broadly speaking true. Uh, Israel, the, the original Zionist project was very secular and it was kind of predicated on the concerns really of European Ashkenazi Jews and over the last 75 years, it's, it's changed a lot. It's become more populous, right, by a lot, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, it's more Hebrew. When it started off, people having to learn Hebrew seemed like an oddity, bringing back a dead language, whereas now it's a living fact. It's a little bigger geographically. It's certainly more religious, for reasons we'll look at. It's more prosperous. It's militarily stronger. It now includes more Jews from Africa, the Falashas, and far more from the former Soviet Union. And there is at least some prospect of acceptance by Arab states, even if in the current crisis, the one that's going on while we're recording this, that seems to be pushing a little further away. But the longer term trajectory is at least in that direction. Well, let's take a look at this this graph of Israel's population and this is running from the foundation of the state in 1948 when it was just a whisker over a million people and by 2019 it was just over 9 million now it's actually 9.85 million so just under 10 million people so that's that's nearly a tenfold increase over those 75 76 76 years let's say so that's pretty substantial. You know, Israel's not that big a country. That's becoming at least a little bit crowded. Yeah, 10 times. That's a, that's a gigantic level of change. I mean, what would the equivalence for, say, the U.S. and Britain over that same time frame? Well, be? back in 1948, the U.S. population was, I'm guessing, but I, in World War II, it was about 150 million. Call it 160 million in 1948. Well, that would mean there'd be 1,600 million people, 1. 1.6 billion in the US now. And of course, there isn't. It's, it's doubled or a little more than doubled to about 3, 30, 3, 40 million, something like that. Britain hasn't even grown by that much. It was around, it was just a little shy of 50 million in 1948, and it's about 67 million today. So it's grown by 35%, something like that. Whereas this has grown by 900%. So yeah, that's really <laughs> that's pretty radical. Yes, the 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 inflow of hasn't been people coming in hasn't been completely uniform, but there's also been a lot of internal growth from simply high birth rates, which are falling now, but they're still you know the Israeli average is three births per woman. Well. The West as a whole is now well under the replacement rate of 2.1. You know, we're looking at even the slightly better countries in Europe are running at 1.8. And the really terrible ones are down there at 1.35, 1.4. So compared to that, three births per woman looks pretty good. Right. So yeah, it's, it's continuing to grow. We've also seen some territorial growth. So... The map on our left here shows that the area in orange is Israel in 1949. And the, the current area shows now, well, the, the Gaza Strip is, of course, being fought over as we, as we speak. 
but it's been it's not independent but it's been kind of self-governing in, in ways that we're, we're not going to dive into now because everybody the world and his wife is talking and fighting and screaming about this right now but but anyway it's it, it's kind of kind not part of israel and the west bank well the israeli government would consider that part of its own territory even if quite a few countries in the world uh, don't so there's been that growth and we'll have a look at how that occurred in um a few minutes it's true to say that israel is a uh, is it more religious? There's much greater religious influence in Israel now than in 1948. Remember, it was started as a secular project and a lot of devout Jews, I don't say all, but very many, opposed the Zionist project. They thought it impious. Even so, some people moved there. So you have the strange phenomenon of some ultra-Orthodox Jews living in Israel, not recognizing the state of Israel, which seems bizarre to outsiders but internally that makes sense <laughs> there's a lesson there for us i think in respect of most countries that loads of things which to an outsider just look crazy that, that that can't possibly be true but if you get inside then things start to make make a lot of sense uh, oh, i had this experience myself with all those years living in america right things about america that just didn't make sense uh, uh, some of them still don't make sense, uh, and I've been there. But at least they, they make sense in how the dynamic comes about that these situations. But okay, this report from the Times of Israel back last October, just two days before the awful attacks, of course, an Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics survey published in 2021 found that among Israeli Jews over the age of 20, about 45 percent identified as secular or not religious while 33% said they practiced traditional religious worship. Ultra-Orthodox Jews, known as Haredim in Hebrew, made up 10%. So now, religious Jews and hardline nationalist settlers have far higher birth rates than secular Jews. So the demographic tide has been moving in their favor. But what holds them back is that lots of children of the ultra-Orthodox abandon their family's strict lifestyle because they just find it intolerable. So if it weren't for that fact, then I, th I think probably the strongly religious would totally have engulfed the Israeli system by now and perhaps have become a majority, but, but they're not. But they, they have nevertheless grown in, in influence. Yeah, and is this change explained only by differing birth rates? That's a large part of it. It may also be affected by who's coming in. Uh, I would find it hard to believe that the, the million that came in from the Soviet Union were necessarily particularly devout, or at least that they were mostly, perhaps most of the Falachas were from, from Ethiopia. So I, I suspect that it, to no small degree, yeah, it's it's going to be a case of differing birth rates. Okay, so here we have uh, a graph showing Israel's GDP per capita, which has grown enormously. Just quickly to explain to people who may not be familiar with the term, GDP is gross domestic product, the total value of all the goods and services produced in a country. So GDP per capita is that value divided by the number of people in the country. And that makes it possible to compare a very large country with a very small country, right? So we can compare Liechtenstein with China and come to the correct conclusion that even though Liechtenstein's GDP is tiny compared to China's, nevertheless, people in Liechtenstein are one heck of a lot better off than they are in China, right? So GDP per capita is a useful thing. So around the time of the founding, it's around $5,000. By 2018, it's north of $30,000. And is this graph showing us the figures adjusted for inflation? Is it really comparing like with like? Uh, yeah, actually it is. It's showing, it's showing the figures in constant 2011 US dollars. 
But by 2011 US dollars, what you mean is the purchasing power of US dollars in 2011. So yeah, it is, it is comparing like with like. In, in the 1950s, um, Israel was in a terrible mess. The, the, the war that had founded the country had cost a lot. Uh, there wasn't a lot of infrastructure, only what the Jews themselves had built for, for most part in the preceding few years. Um, and a very high proportion of GDP was actually not earned or made by the Israelis themselves. It was received from West Germany, who were giving reparations for Jewish property that had been stolen or destroyed during World War II. But they, fortunately, they grew out of that phase and, and then got, as it were, onto a, a more solid base. So now, yeah, they're certainly a very prosperous country. Well, just to give us a flavour of what life was like or might have looked like a little bit in the early days, we've got a nice picture here from Tel Aviv, which served as the capital until 1967 in 1950. So just a, a fairly ordinary scene of a, a bus station there and what looks like pretty newly thrown up apartment buildings behind. One person we should mention, whom almost everybody above <clears throat> a certain age will remember, uh, from the TV screens in their childhood is this man, Moshe Dayan. And he certainly has this kind of swashbuckling image. It's the patch on his eye that, that did it. He, he was born to Ukrainian immigrants in a Zionist kibbutz in Ottoman Palestine, 1915. World War I's going on. The Ottomans are still just about in control, only for another two years. When he was 14 years old, he joined Haganah, a Jewish self-defense force. That will have been during the fairly early years of the British mandate. Like a lot of such people, when the World War II happens, he agreed to fight alongside the British because the alternative was a lot worse. And in 1941, he lost his eye. He would have been, what, 26 years old in an Australian raid on Vichy-held Lebanon. Now, this is sounding confusing. Remember, France had the mandate for Syria and, and Lebanon, just as Britain had the interwar mandate for Palestine, Transjordan, and Iraq. Well, when France fell to the Germans in 1940, a sort of puppet state was set up in the southern part of France, in the little town of Vichy, which was fascist sympathizing. And so the French authorities will have gone along with that, the French authorities in Lebanon. So they basically sided with the Germans. So the British and Australians, felt they needed to get these people out of the way because they, they didn't want an attack on themselves in Palestine while they were busy trying to fend off the Italians and Germans in North Africa. So he's involved in that fighting. That's where he lost his eye. Uh, he was really upset about this early on. But later on, if anything, it helped his tough guy image. I'm just thinking that maybe you should try an eye patch sometime. That's really good of you. <laughs> Yes, right. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh. Sure. He becomes Israel's chief of staff in 1953. So he's still, what, 38 years old, holds that job for five years. He's Minister of Defence from the time of the uh, 67 war through till 1974 under uh, Golda Meir, who we'll meet in a minute, and Minister of Foreign Affairs in the late 1970s. He has some very depressing things to say about Israeli policy, particularly in the early years. He led, from 48 to 52, the Southern Command, which, among other things, conducted retaliation raids against Palestinian saboteurs. He said, it's the only method that has proved effective. It's not justified or moral, but effective. When the Arab plants mines on our side. If we try to search for that Arab, it has no value. In other words, <laughs> you're not going to succeed in finding who it is. But if we harass the nearby village, then the population there comes out against the saboteur. And the Egyptian government and the Transjordanian government are willing to prevent such incidents because their prestige is at stake. As the Jews have opened fire and they're unready to begin a war, the method of collective punishment so far has proved effective. There are no other effective methods. 
This is really harsh. It's hard to imagine any other Western countries allowing this to be their method of procedure. Right. Uh, but Israel justifies it by pointing at the extreme situation they face. No other country surrounded by people who literally want to destroy it and kill its population. And also because, as we still find today, its enemies make a point of locating themselves among the civilian population. So, Dan was right. There are no other effective methods? Well, perhaps it, it depends on what we mean by effective. I effective in the short term for that particular confrontation, probably. But the fact that we're still on the same page in 2024 shows it probably doesn't work in the long term. And this other little quotation from him uh, shows a slightly different aspect of things. We, we can't save, he says, each water pipe from explosion or each tree from being uprooted. We cannot prevent the murder of workers in orange groves or of families in their beds. But we can put a very high price on their blood, a price so high that it will no longer be worthwhile for the Arabs, the Arab armies, for the Arab states, to pay it. So this is the Old Testament eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of stuff? Uh, pretty much. And, and the fact that he concedes that not all Israelis can be protected, that inevitably some will be killed, has also produced the standard Israeli government line that all Israelis are frontline soldiers. And the corollary of that is that there will be no negotiation with terrorists. If you're captured, even if you're a child, the Israeli government will not place an absolute value on your life. Uh, and, and we've seen some incidents of that. Um, what we're seeing right now with the hostages being held in Gaza, <laughs> it seems strange to say it in the midst of the terrible fighting that's going on, but represents something like a softening of that Israeli line that there are things they're prepared to do to try and get their hostages back that, that, that might, might be called negotiation. But otherwise, they're, for the most part, they've generally just been prepared to shoot their way in and whoever survives that shooting their way in survives and whoever doesn't, doesn't. Uh, their reasoning on that, of course, is that if we negotiate, that simply encourages more such incidents that we save more Israeli lives by never negotiating. Right. Humoring until we're ready to shoot our way in, basically that. So it's very much tough guy stuff. Uh, and it, it goes against the grain of what Westerners are used to, but we have softer lives. And they would say, sorry, we're in a very rough neighborhood. This is the only way we can do this. Make it that way you will. Well, the, the, the next war with the Arab states was the Suez War of 1956, and it was fought in complicity with the British and the French. Well, Nasser, who had fairly recently come to power in Egypt, uh, decided to nationalize the Suez Canal, simply take it away from the British and the French, who had built it and who, in the late 19th century, or 18, 1860s, 1870, and controlled it ever since. He, he nationalizes it. And the British and the French are really mad about this. They're also, I think, afraid that he will politicize its use and maybe make the ability of global shipping to use it dependent on political demands of his own. So they decide to go and take it back. And there's a backroom deal done with the Israeli government that Britain and France will move their forces into the Suez Canal, and once they've got control of it, Israel will advance onto the Sinai Peninsula. And you can see here from these maps, that's exactly what happened. And of course, once the British and the French are controlling the Suez Canal, the Egyptians can't reinforce their own people in Sinai. They're, they're basically cut off from the rest of Egypt. And the that military operation more or less works like clockwork. But what brings it down is that America was really mad at the British and the French for doing this because they saw it as exertion of old style colonial power, which was something that America stood against. 
and they were in a position not, not to threaten force, of course, but the British government owed so much money to Washington that the Americans threatened to, to call in their debts unless the British pulled their forces out of Suez. And so growling and snarling, they had to do precisely that. But Israel didn't get to keep a hold of the Suez Canal afterwards. It didn't right? get the Suez Canal. It didn't, it, it didn't even hang on to Sinai at that point. Later on, in, after the 1967 war, it would. Yeah, but at, at that point, it satisfied itself with simply trashing over the Egyptian military, uh, which it did, um, and ensuring that it wouldn't be attacked for some time to come. In 1960, uh, something really quite extraordinary happens. Uh, one senior fugitive Nazi, he'd gone to Argentina, Adolf Eichmann, was captured uh, by Mossad in Argentina and spirited back to Israel, where he was put on trial for war crimes, for having orchestrated the Holocaust, not, not all of it, but a significant number of those deaths. He was put on trial, and we have here an excerpt from his letter to the Israeli president of the time, Yitzhak ben Zvi, pleading for clemency. We may have little enough sympathy with what he has to say. The judges, he said, made a fundamental mistake in their judgment of me because they're not able to empathize with the time and situation in which I found myself during the war years. I think we can already see the kind of argument he's making, right? I, I was afraid I, I was going to be in trouble right. myself. I did what I had to do. I never served in such a high position as required to be involved independently in such decisive responsibilities, nor did I give any orders in my own name, but only ever acted by order of. So I was only following orders, is his plea. It's also incorrect that I never let myself be influenced by human emotions, specifically after having witnessed the outrageous human atrocities, so he now apparently at least admits that's what they were, I immediately asked to be transferred. He didn't say that he was transferred. Also during the police investigation, I voluntarily revealed horrors that had been unknown until then in order to help establish the indisputable truth. I detest as the greatest of crimes the horrors which were perpetrated against the Jews and think it right that the initiators of these terrible deeds will stand trial before the law now and in the future. Notwithstanding, there is a need to draw a line between the leaders responsible and the people like me forced to serve as mere instruments in the hands of the leaders. I was not a responsible leader and as such do not feel myself guilty. Well, the court, needless to say, felt otherwise, and he was executed. By the way, it's during this trial, which the great Jewish intellectual Hannah Arendt, she, she was German, but lived in America for a long time, went to uh, Israel to observe this trial, published her thoughts on it, but she coined the famous phrase, the banality of evil. Looking at him, you know, he, he didn't seem like some monster incarnate. He was a dull, boring little man. And she wanted to say, you know, this is this is the truth of the fact. When we look at the enormity of the crimes that were committed, automatically we want to see some kind of like obvious pantomime demon in human form. And that's not what you've got. You've got this this dull non-entity who merely pleads that he was do he was following orders. It didn't stop him from executing no, him. No, no, it didn't. But he was in Argentina when they captured him. I mean, how did they manage to get him five thousand miles away and then bring him to oh, Israel? The details of this case, I'm afraid I don't know. I just want to dive out and say Mossad, they can do magic. I mean like like uh you know, CIA, MI five, just eat your heart out hearts out. The these guys <laughs> have managed amazing things. We'll mention some, some more of them in a few minutes. Yeah, I, I think they've got a box of magic wands somewhere. But uh, there's, there's basically there's almost no length to which they're pre not prepared to go to achieve what they want. And certainly in this period, one of the main things they wanted to do was to make sure that as many senior Nazis as they could get their hands on would face justice. As who can blame them? Well, 
that there's a whole load of aspects of Israel's history since 1948, particularly in the most recent times, that we're not going to look at. We're not, perhaps the frustration of some viewers, we're not going to look at the current brouhaha because the, the news feeds are full of it. Commentators are talking about it every day from all kinds of possible different angles. Firstly, we can't compete with that. And, and, and secondly, what we're trying to do is put people in a position to make their own conclusions by looking at this long-term historical background. So maybe you should consider uh, at least briefly the Six-Day War of June 5th to 10th in 1967. Um, Israel was well aware uh, of an impending attack by Egypt, Jordan and Syria. Uh, you could say was, this was more Mossad magic, but actually they didn't even need that. The Arab leaders were trumpeting their preparations for destroying what they called <laughs> the Israel gang, as if there were like 30 of them, you know. So knowing this, Israel struck first. It destroyed most of Egypt's air force on the ground. They had much better leadership and equipment and the element of surprise. And this helped them in overcoming vastly greater numbers. In terms of soldiers, they were out another 10 to 1. They captured the Sinai Peninsula again and held it this time and the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem, so, so reuniting the city and the West Bank and the Golan Heights. So to get a feel on that, let's take a look at some of the maps here. This shows the, the fighting in Sinai over a few days in early June with Israeli forces advancing. Here we have Israeli troops at the, the Western or Wailing Wall after the capture of East Jerusalem. And Israel also captured the Golan Heights, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. The, the rationale for this was that um, settlements in northern Israel to the north and the west of Galilee had been regularly bombarded from the Golan Heights. And so the Israeli forces simply advanced there to capture them as a way of uh, protecting their own settlements. And in fact, this next picture shows up, shows soldiers rounding up the local population of Kunetra in Golan. And our last map shows the results of the Six Day War. So Israel in control of Gaza and Sinai, the West Bank and the Golan Heights. Considering the strength of Arab honor culture, a defeat like this must have been really hard to accept. Yes, very, very hard to accept. Uh, in fact, uh, the fighting didn't stop when we think of the war as having ended after just a few days, the Six Day War. Yeah, it, it carried on. There was a low level so-called war of attrition for about three years after this. There were constant incidents that ended up killing several thousand people. And, and not just on the Arab side. I mean, Israeli losses were significant as well. Um, yeah, it didn't just stop there. Well, um, Shortly after this, Labour Prime Minister Golda Meir comes to power in Israel. She'd been born in Kiev. She'd emigrated to the US in 1906 when she would have been just eight years old. And th then 15 years later, when she would have been, what, 23, emigrated again to a kibbutz in Palestine. So she's living under the British mandate for nearly all of the lifetime of that mandate. And in 1948, as Israel is being founded, she raises $50 million in the US to buy arms in Europe for Israel. Let's just slow that down. Money from America, buying arms in Europe to go to Israel to help in the foundation of Israel. One thing we need to remember is that the, Lab the Labour Party is the dominant party, the usual party of government in Israel until the late 70s, 1980 or so. It's an absolute shadow of itself now. It's only got a handful of members of the Knesset, the current Knesset. It's not even one of the major parties anymore because there's been this shift to the right, which is one of the last figures anyway in this continuum of Labour dominance of government. I think we can safely say that. It's during her tenure that there is the, the famous or notorious massacre of Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics in 1972. And this, as you can imagine, it would cause agony for any government, but particularly for the West German government, right? We're, we're only, what, 27, out, 27 years out 
from the end of World War II, the Holocaust is still very fresh in everybody's memory. And <laughs> of all people they would want to protect at the Olympic Games, it was the Israelis. And what happens? Eight Palestinians captured 11 of the Israeli team and held them hostage, demanded the release of 234 prisoners being held in Israel, the principal members of the German Red Army faction terrorist group in West Germany. And the German Red Army faction, what was that? Well, we remember, of course, that East Germany is a Soviet satellite state, so it's communist. West Germany is democratic, and it has, for a long time after World War II, uh, American and British and French forces based there, not so much to keep the population down, like immediately after the war, as to keep the Soviets out. The Red Army faction was a communist terror group inside West Germany, attacking targets of the state, wanting West Germany to be communist as well. It wasn't the only one, but it was one of the most important ones. So they are linked up with the Palestinians, because by now, certainly, well, even before the 1967 war, Israel is firmly in America's camp. And that means, by the binary logic of the Cold War, that the Soviets are backing the Arabs. So that, that, there's that kind of logic to it. Well, Israel wasn't going to give away anything to these terrorists. So they couldn't tell the West German government, we'll offer them this, because they wouldn't. And so the, the, the West German police had no option but to try and break in there, kill the terrorists and rescue whoever they could. But inevitably, that meant that the captives were in extreme peril. And in fact, although the German police killed five of the attackers, all 11 captives and a German policeman were killed. And the three surviving terrorists were captured. OK, well, in, in 1973, there was another Arab-Israeli war, and this time the Israelis were caught napping. Uh, it's called the Yom Kippur War, the, the Day of Atonement, because it happens, it, it's an Arab attack that is deliberately timed for when loads of uh, Israeli military and office holders will be off duty. It's a bit like if someone decided to attack I don't know, Britain or America, on Christmas Day, something like that. And once again, Israeli forces are uh, very much outnumbered, uh, outgunned, although you can see that the disparity is not quite as extreme as it had been in 1967. So you can see from this map the Syrian forces moving back into the Golan Heights. And in the next map, Egyptian forces breaking over the Suez Canal and penetrating Sinai. Israel at first suffers significant reverses. But nevertheless, within a few days, Israel manages to recover itself and push back. You can see that the, the ceasefire lines um, in this last map here reflect the, the less unequal nature of the outcome than in 1967. Israeli forces, they didn't manage to get back to the Suez Canal at every point. But in that central section there, they not only reached it, they got across it and had forces in Africa, right, in African Egypt. And they did actually extend their hold uh, on the Golan. I mean, one of the other consequences of this is it precipitates the global uh, oil crisis in which uh, Arab oil producing states uh, get together and start to um, drastically reduce uh, oil sales to Western countries to punish them for having supported Israel and so on. So it's, it's an ongoing crisis. The 1970s is a very uncomfortable time, uh, not just in Israel, but in the wider West. We, we can't go much further, however, without mentioning the terrible incident of May 1974, which is the Marlot, and it illustrates perfectly the Israeli policy of not negotiating with terrorists. In May 74, a group of three, just three Palestinian terrorists based in Lebanon, snuck across the, the border into Israel, dressed in IDF, Israeli Defense Force uniforms, killed several Israelis, including a married couple and their young daughter, and took 105 children and 10 adults hostage 
in a school at Mar Lot in northern Israel. And they demanded the release of 23 Palestinian prisoners. After a siege, the school was stormed by Israeli commandos and the terrorists were killed, but unfortunately 25 hostages, um, 22 children and three adults were killed as well. So it was a shocking event. Oh, this picture shows a young Israeli carrying his sister away from the massacre where so many had died. Well, staying on these kind of hostage situations, the most dramatic of the lot that sticks in the memory of everybody that heard about it is the episode in Entebbe, uh, which triggers what the Israeli military called Operation Thunderbolt. On June 27th, 1976, an Air France flight is en route from Tel Aviv via Athens to Paris. Tel Aviv to Paris, stopping off in Athens. 248 passengers and 12 crew. It was hijacked. Now, got to say that in the late 60s and through the 70s, plane hijackings were very frequent in a variety of causes. This was hijacked by two Palestinians and two West German Red terrorists. It was flown to Uganda, which at that time was under the control of Idi Amin, who was, was he clinically a psychopath? Possibly. It was certainly extremely erratic and brutal. So it's in, it's in Uganda, uh, in, in Entebbe Airport, and he is acting the part of the benign intermediary between these people so that we can get the hostages back and the people holding them. But in fact, he is in league with the terrorists. Um, the hijackers want the release of 40 Palestinians in Israel and 13 others held in other countries in exchange for the 94 remaining passengers and 12 crew because the majority of the passengers who were not Israelis were released. So on the ground there, you've got the, the plane there for several days. And on July the 4th, so a, a week into... Um, a, a week into this escapade, Israel flew a hundred commandos and attacked the airport in the middle of the night because the the hostages were no longer on the plane; they were they were in airport buildings, and their arrival was completely unexpected because they thought they were so far away from Israel, uh, nothing can happen. But what they what Israel did was to land several planes in Entebbe in the middle of the night, largely without lights, and they brought enough people to bring back the hostages. All of the hijackers were killed, as was one of the commandos, and as were three hostages, and 48 Ugandan soldiers on the ground. And in the course of the, the carnage, at least 11, perhaps as many as 30 Ugandan aircraft were destroyed on the ground, and the hostages were flown back to Israel to, as you can imagine, absolute jubilation. Now, to, to get up handle on this, take a look at the map, and you can see the magnitude of what they achieved. It was conducted two and a half thousand miles away from home base. And of course, because aircraft can't generally fly 5,000 miles, it entailed cooperation with the Kenyans. So Israel enjoyed decent relations with Kenya, which suddenly got a whole lot better after this. And so they, they refueled in Nairobi. Well, we've got some pictures here of people arriving back from Entebbe. Of course, their relatives thought this was impossible, but it had been done. Uh, and again, it's just indicative of the extreme determination of Israelis to, to get done what needs doing despite everything. Some years later, when Americans were held hostage in Iran uh, in the early stages of the Iranian Revolution, President Carter sadly made a totally botched attempt to copy this by flying in Marines. It didn't get anybody out. A number of Marines were killed and helicopters lost. It was a disaster. But, but the Israelis, as it were, had done it right. Well, th this guy here is Dan Shomron. He's the leader of the Entebbe raid. 
It's time now to say a bit more about Mossad. As created in 1949, it's probably the world's most ruthless, intelligent and covert operations body. It's carried out countless assassinations, abductions, bomb attacks. One Palestinian terrorist, for example, was, was killed in Paris by an exploding telephone. <laughs> like something out, of, something out of James Bond. In 1960, as we've said, it abducted war criminal Adolf Eichmann in Argentina and spirited him back to Jerusalem. In 1969, and, and this indicates how uh, Israel is prepared to take actions even against basically friendly nations. Three missile boats had been contracted to be bought from France. But because of political changes in Paris, the French had later retracted the deal. The boats were sitting there idly in Cherbourg and Mossad sent in people in the middle of the night inside the boats, cast off and drove them away. And that was it. And in 1986, an Israeli citizen, Mordecai Vanunu, who had leaked Israel's nuclear secrets to the British press, was lured from England to Italy by a honey trap, and then he was kidnapped and imprisoned in Israel for 18 years. So... A honey trap. A honey game. trap. Well, I don't know whether it was necessarily explicitly sex or whether he simply had contact from a, a very promising, extremely pretty girl that he, he thought would be... I, I don't, I'm afraid I don't know the details on this. So, yeah, that, that's what you mean by a honey trap. Sometimes it is simply like um, nice. prostitutes being used to bring people into um, uh, perhaps ridiculously compromising situations so that you can blackmail them, but it might be a way of physically getting hold of them. Well, the, 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 the situation between Israel and the Arabs is clearly at some kind of impasse. Nasser had died in 1970, and he had been replaced by Anwar Sadat. And the Americans, particularly under Jimmy Carter, were brokering uh, a deal between Egypt and Israel. The main thing that Israel wanted was recognition from Egypt, which was and remains one of the most important Arab states. So recognition of Israel's right to exist as a legitimate state and, and uh, uh, peaceful relations. So Jimmy Carter gets Sadat and Menachem Begin, whose career had started in terrorist activities against the British. He's now Israeli Prime Minister, and he's for, for, uh, for from the Likud party, not from Labour, but from the right. This is around the time that you get this kind of shift in the centre of gravity in Israeli politics. And the Camp David Accords of 1978 make a formal peace treaty in 1979 between Egypt and Israel, which has held ever since. Uh, nobody could ever describe relations between Egypt and Israel as great, but peace, there is. Formal recognition, there is. And as part of this, as we can see from the map here, um, Israel returns the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt, not the Gaza Strip that has kind of like special status there. And also, you can just about see it up in the north there, part of the Golan Heights are returned to Syria um, a little later. And I have it on good authority that a group of more radical American Christians uh, were convinced that Sadat was the Antichrist. And so when he was assassinated sometime after this, everybody was waiting to see if he was going to come back from the dead. I'm staggered. There, there seems no end of bizarre theories that people will come up with and you know, their, their willingness to identify the Antichrist with some kind of certainty. It seems boundless. I remember as when I was young, clearly some centuries BC, in, in Swansea in South Wales, uh, understanding that there were some, some local people who identified the co-op with the Antichrist. The co-op was, it was like a supermarket. I always thought it was the Piggly Wiggly myself, but but it's just bizarre. Yes. Good grief. The list of people being added to potential antichrists is getting pretty yeah. long, so you and I had probably better be careful with uh, yeah, what we're doing. Yeah, I could just perhaps. see the kind of feedback we're gonna get from having this discussion. Getting <laughs> swiftly back on course here. <laughs>
<laughs> well, another deal is done um, in 1993. This one broke by Bill Clinton. Between Yitzhak Rabin, the Israeli Prime Minister, he makes the so-called Oslo Accords with the PLO chairman Yasser Arafat. Now, we one of the, one of our bigger missions here is we are simply talking strictly about Israel and hardly at all about the Palestinians. Historically, of course, that's a very bad omission, but we're we're trying to cover just a little bit strictly in respect of Israel and the Jews in a short time. Um, the PLO was the Palestine Liberation Organization. Uh, and um, its chairman was Yasser Arafat for a, a very long time. Um, the PLO was uh, a species, a local species of Arab nationalism. Now, Arab nationalism really only comes into existence in the early 20th century. It's encouraged a lot by the British during World War I to encourage Arabs to rise up against the Ottomans, but... You know, it's like uh, something that comes back to bite them then later on. So, yeah, that's the, that's the Palestine Liberation Organization. And it establishes the Palestinian National Authority, giving partial autonomy to Gaza and the West Bank. And, and Rabin was assassinated um, just a couple of years after this in 1995 by a religious zealot, in Israel, who thinks he should never have made such a deal with with the Arabs. Uh, Sadat, uh, by the way, had been assassinated some years before in 1982 for having made the first deal with Israel, uh, again, by a religious zealot. And, and what we've seen on both sides of this divide is the center of political gravity move away from nationalism, which in the Israeli case would be Zionism, old, old secular type Zionism to a more religiously informed form of nationalism, let us say. And on the Arab side, um, and this is far bigger than just Egypt or the Palestinians, it's right across the Muslim world, a move away from Arab nationalism to Islamism, which is a growing force and still with us, of course, in uh, from, let's say, around 1980 onwards. Although if you want to look at a non-Arab country like Iran, okay, the Islamic Revolution happens there in 1979. So, yeah, this is, Rabin is, as it were, paying the ultimate price for that kind of shift, as had Sadat before him. But the autonomy granted to Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza is heavily circumscribed and satisfies almost no one. So we can see on the map here, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, but there's loads of areas with Israeli control. Each one of those little triangles um, signifies an Israeli settlement on the West Bank. So it's honeycombed by um, areas of Israeli direct control. Well, Ariel Sharon uh, becomes Prime Minister He's an ultra hardliner in Israel in 2001 to 2006. He had a rather dark history. He had been a strategist in the 67 and 73 wars, which is fine. But he had also facilitated the 1982 massacres at the Sabra and Shatila Palestinian refugee camps in Beirut during the incredibly complicated Lebanese civil war. So looked upon him coming to power with extreme foreboding. Well, we, we're not really going to follow in detail events beyond that point because they're, they're so recent, they're the centre of current debate. I, would, I think it's perhaps better if we kind of finish off by looking at some of the generalities about Israel. Uh, in particular, its political system. The Knesset, the Israeli parliament in Jerusalem, has 120 members, which... This is just my personal opinion, and I don't want to reflect badly, say, on the American system where there's 100 members in the Senate. But, you know, I think that a round number is a bad idea because it makes it harder to, in tight situations to get a majority. You know, 99 or 101 would have been better. And in the case of particular, and this is even more the case uh, in, in respect of Israel, because they're 120 members, they have 
a pure form of proportional representation. And that means governments are always unstable coalitions with narrow majorities. Very few are long lasting. Can you quickly remind us what proportional representation is all about? I mean, most Europeans will have that system or at least be familiar with them, but most Americans will be confused. I yes. Suspect. OK, well, it's uh, a way of voting where mostly you vote for party lists rather than necessarily for a specific candidate. And then the end result is that the number of representatives that go to the the legislative body, in this case the Knesset, is as closely mathematically proportional as can be to the percentage of votes that they received in the public. Now, one thing that that does is encourage uh, a lot of small political parties. So, for example, one reason why it's kind of hopeless to start, say, a third party in America is that even if you got, say, 5% of the vote, you'd come third everywhere. At best, you might come second in a couple of places, right? And you'd end up with nothing. Whereas if you have a, a pure proportional representation system, if you got 5% of the, the vote, you'd have 5% of the seats in the Knesset, right? So it encourages more political parties. In theory, that should encourage governments to be closer to the centre, but it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, the Weimar Republic, Germany between the world wars, well, up until 1933, when the Nazis seized power, they had this system. And look what happened to them. It's, it, it gave leverage to Nazis and communists. So although a lot of European countries have proportional representation system today, they usually have a 5% threshold. In other words, get less than 5%, you got nothing. But above that, you do. And it's kind of a calculated gamble. It's a way of saying, we think that this will make it really hard for fascists and communists to get in. <laughs> right? Whereas Israel doesn't have that. They have the pure form, like in the Weimar Republic. And that means they got lots of political parties. Let's take a look at the way things are now. This is the current Knesset. It's, but it's not usually quite as bad as this, but it's usually pretty bad which would be a nightmare if it was a really large body like the US House of Representatives or the British House of Commons, where there's hundreds and hundreds of representatives. Right? They've only got 120 and you've got 18 parties. I mean, this is madness. Right? So, but, and, and what it does is it tends to give disproportionate power to the small parties that are in government that can say to whoever's the prime minister of the day, if you don't give us what we want, we're out of the government and there's a general election, you're out of power, buddy. Okay, so Israel's population is changing. If we look at this graph, we can see that in the early 1950s, um, nearly 90% of the population of Israel was Jewish after so many Palestinians had been driven out, right? But because of higher Arab birth rates, even allowing for the massive influx of so many people as immigrants into Israel, still, as a proportion, they are only about, um, well, as of 2024, they're 73.2% of the population, so less than three quarters. Now, as I said, they have a higher birth rate than most European countries or than North America at three babies per woman, but, but the Arab birth rate is higher again. I don't want to overstate that. Both birth rates are falling. But in those kind of situations, it's the group whose birth rate falls last or more slowly that wins out in terms of demography. So maybe this is an advert for if you want to see real political change in your country, have lots of babies. <laughs> I yeah yes but I you know I think that only a fairly few rather worryingly fanatical people would make that the prime motivation for having, having babies and and also and I can think of too many awful circumstances in which there's ethnic conflict and one party accuses the other of being like a vast conspiracy to outbreed them 
right? Which is which is bonkers because people don't think like that, right? But what what we if if we're right. worried about the right. demography of either of your country or your group within it, whatever it is, um, what's needed is a culture that nurtures family, that nurtures marriage, that nurtures the bringing up of children and values them rather than looks upon them as a consumer good or as a burden upon the parents' freedom or something like that. I'm starting to preach now, aren't I? I'll, I'll stop there. Anyway, but, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea, but only a very few people really do that. <laughs> so it could be my, I mean, somebody's secondary motivation is what uh, you're saying. Tertiary or quaternary, I would have thought. But yeah, but maybe there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I speak as the grandfather of nine kids, which is now a very unusual thing. And am I proud of it? Yes, I am. But, but did I do it to make a religious or political point? No. <laughs> I like to think that we've just had the kind of family where that just happen. <laughs> well, at least not a public point right, anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the things you accuse me of. Anyway, so concerning demography, the median age of Israeli Jews is 31.6. The median age of Israeli Arabs is 21.1. If those are just numbers to you, the median age in America or Britain would be about 39 or 40. Birth rates are far higher among Orthodox Jews and among settlers, and not all settlers are particularly religious. Some of them are ultra-nationalist zealots, but some of them are religious zealots, than they are among seculars. And of course, that means that over time, the center of gravity of political influence in Israel is moving in their direction. The median age of West Bank settlers is just 19.7. Well, that's like in Gaza, then amongst the Arabs. It's really low. In Jerus amongst Jerusalem Jews, it's not as extreme as that, but Me'a Sherim is a, a very orthodox area in, in Jerusalem. The median age is 24.9, which is well below the Israeli average of 31.6. What you've got going on here is religious population, lots of babies, low median age. Secular population, they're like Europeans or Americans. So low birth rates, below replacement rate. Almost a million Jews arrived from the former USSR during 1989 to 2006. After 1977, Falashas, Bayit Israel, black Jews from Ethiopia were helped to come to Israel. And by now there's well over 100,000 of them there, they and their, their descendants. Well, our last few pictures are disturbing really um we've got some pictures of settlers on the west bank here beating an arab woman there's constant conflict between settlers and local arabs who feel that their their gardens their orchards their houses are being encroached upon their roads blocked and so on some more settlers attacking an arab lady settlers here with target practice um they're afraid that they might become targets, and sometimes they are. This last picture shows Palestinians threatening settlers who are erecting an illegal building. These people are mostly going in there to make a point. They're ideologically driven. And at least under right-wing governments in Israel, and most of them are right-wing the, in recent decades, they're getting at least a nudge and a wink from their own government. So... There is that difference. It, it's trying to change facts on so, the ground. So these would be Israeli settlers moving into Palestinian right. land. Yes. Oh, it's not never in the other direction. It's always in that direction. Yes. Okay. And, and our last picture shows an Israeli soldier forcibly removing illegal settlers. So on some occasions, the Israeli government will act against its own citizens and force them to get out. But that's not the general pattern. In general, the map is being changed, as we saw when we looked at some of those maps earlier on. The facts on the ground are being changed. And, and what you've got now and have had for some years in the West Bank is this kind of thing uh, that we've got in this last picture here. The West Bank wall around Israeli settlements, those white buildings there are Israeli settlements. So it's like a, a large fortress 
and these these walls are snaking right across the West Bank. Okay, well, to conclude then, where we, we came in, and we looked at this earlier, the, the difference from, between 1948 and 2024, Israel's now much more populous, 10 times the population. It's more Hebrew. Hebrew is very definitely a first language for not all the population, of course, not the recent arrivals, but the majority of the population. It's a little bit bigger territorially. It's more religious. It's a lot more prosperous. It's militarily stronger. And it now includes more Jews from Africa, Flashes, and from the former Soviet Union. And there's at least some prospect of acceptance by Arab states, even if that's been largely derailed by the events of the last, what is it, four or five months, something like that. And that pretty much brings us to an end of this series, I think. Yes. Wow. We covered a lot of ground. We have. (laughs) And I'm sure we've satisfied nobody. (laughs) We've we've squeezed in what we could. We've squeezed in what we could. And we're going to change tack in in future weeks. Absolutely. And we're looking forward to it. So thank you, everybody, so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. It's free. And please repost the link on social media to share us with your friends. And also check out the Substack blog, Substack Taking the Pierce, which covers a similar range of topics to what we're doing here, but has the advantage that unlike this, you can read them silently without interrupting your children screaming. So until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from her. (laughs) Goodbye. Goodbye.